Ken. Hi. I'm Eric from Australia. Hi. Uh, admire your work greatly, and it's really moved me in my life. Thank you. Um, yeah, I've just got an interesting question for myself. Um, actually, for you, but for myself. <laughs> uh, last year, I gave my old Japanese Zen master uh, ayahuasca for his 69th birthday. There you go. <laughs> One of his students also took it with us. And did you, did you the, take it too? I took it too, There yeah. you go, boy. And I've just, just come from the Amazon from a crazy sort of shamanistic Christian religion that's, that's growing in Brazil at the moment. You've got quite a, quite a uh, path here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very interesting. Yeah. Um, anyway, at the end of the session, the, the young monk was, was very upset because he felt that he'd broken his precept of not taking drugs. Yeah. And he asked my teacher and our, our teacher, what was that? Was that a drug? Yeah. And my, my very humble Japanese teacher said, ah, I think it was a food. <laughs> <laughs> yes, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> and, and, and usually he just enjoys beer and, but, and nothing else. And that was the first thing he'd ever had of a psychedelic you know, uh, nature. Anyway, um, what I wanted to ask is, what is I haven't r really heard you discussed yeah. the place of entheogens or what was known as psychedelics or power sure. plants in transformative practice do you feel they have a place for me in my own life I, I'm a long-term meditator but I've found certain peak experiences actually using meditation with ayahuasca or mushrooms yeah. to be extremely powerful yeah. and have helped me a lot and actually have taken me actually your work has verified a lot of things that I've sure. experienced in those states yeah. and particularly I like to acknowledge the sort of mysticism of South America as well and what that's yep. offered the world and Central yeah. America. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, could you discuss sure. antigens at all? Thank you. Um, I've tended not to write very much about it because I don't have a lot of experience myself. And I don't know how or why that's so. I mean, as a boomer, it's sort of genetically the case that by the time you're, <laughs> you're 22, you have to have tried eight psychedelics. By the time you're 28, you have to try 12. And if not, they, they can be arrested. <laughs> and so what I have noticed is that there are, um, but I, I, I've watched this for a very long time, and, and it, it, there are a couple of a kind of fundamental constants that kind of keep reoccurring. One is that um, people that use psychedelics and some form of spiritual practice, meditation or something like that, get an enormous a bit out of them. And I think that's because uh, in the meditative states they have some sort of a, um, comparison that they can contrast it, they can get a sense about it. They have been introduced to states that are you know, deeper than the ordinary egoic state. So when they're introduced to something like ayahuasca or something, it's not their first experience, they're not totally taken or blown away by it. They don't overrate it. But at the same time, you, it's clearly the case, as, as far as I can tell, that um, the, the people that do that get experiences like you're talking about that you just can't quite get sitting on a meditation mat. Um, and some of them use it very, very, very positively. And, and I think that um, it's a case that in very judicious uses, uh, some people using both uh, do better than people using either alone. And, and, and it's sort of a generic thing that I, so the more altered states you experience, the more it can help you transform. Um, so I, I, think, I, think that's, I think that's fine, and I think that, that's true. The, the, um, the downside comes with people that only use uh, psychedelics or drugs. And, and I found that over the years, they just become mean. It, it somehow it just kind of closes them down. It's like you, you keep doing it, and you keep doing it, and you keep doing it, and it doesn't quite cause the transformation. It can cause a peak experience but generally not a transformative experience. And some people, like David Data, will say that in order for altered changes of state to contribute to transformation, permanent transformation, it has to be basically endogenous, not exogenous. It has to be, has your own source to do that. Um, uh, the, the people that do use both and use it as a sacrament, I think an enormous bit out of it. And there's, there's one profound way, in sort of an absolute sense, that, that you can use uh, psychedelics. And that is particularly, first of all, to introduce you to certain subtle states. 
but then by subtraction, it introduces you and can help you see that ever-present causal state, that ever-present non-dual state. Because fundamentally, the, the, the more you go into things like big mind, the more you go into the ever-present state, the more you realize it's not an experience. It doesn't have a beginning in time. And anything that has a beginning in time is not real. We're talking for the absolute state. So you might have been in introduced to big mind. And because there was an experiential component to it, big mind itself didn't have an experiential component. What you were experiencing is the ego going, ah, you know, for finally, <laughs> a vacation from me. <laughs> And so you're experiencing all of the gross and subtle as you do that. The more you do it, the more you realize that big mind is the only thing you've ever known. For a billion years, you have only known this noticing, witnessing awareness. There's never a time you can think of when you weren't you. And so the more you deepen that ever-present recognition, the more you realize that whatever is an experience is not it. And one of the ways uh, one of my teachers used to handle this is people would come in, and this is uh, uh, um, Chaga Tolku, who is my root guru in Dzogchen, and people would come in and go, oh, I finally got it, this luminosity and this absolute clarity is amazing. It's like, how could I miss this? It's so great. And he would go, did that have a beginning in time? Go, yeah, yesterday afternoon, and it's like, yeah, and I'm sitting there, and he says, that's not it. Anything that has a beginning in time is temporal. Anything that has a beginning in time has an end in time. And if you equate God with a state like that, then when that state slips, that God slips with it. But what is the witness of that state? It doesn't have a beginning. And so I've actually seen... Uh, people that shall go nameless, uh, Sam Burke Olson region, and they were actually doing psychedelics. And the teacher was basically saying, and this is an intense case of it, are you distracted by these phenomenal displays, extraordinary experiences? Can you find that that is an, not an experience? What part of that doesn't have a beginning? That part is the unborn. That part is what is real. That part is what will stay with you when the fireworks come and go, and they will all come and go. And that's the nature of phenomenal objects. As I say, they come, they stay a bit, they torture you, and they leave. Hmm. Every object you can think of will do that to an extent. And if, you, if it's a painful object, it will torture you while it's there. If it's an object you love, it will torture you when it dies. The only thing that is free of that is the witness. The only thing that's free of that is yourself. The only thing that's free of that is that ever-present I amness. Before Abraham was, I am. Every sentient being can say that. And so this sort of negative lesson for this, the advanced course is to take this stuff and notice it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And there's something that doesn't about that. And the more you accustom yourself to just what you're feeling right now, the more you accustom yourself to that in you which is noticing everything. There's something in you which is conscious of everything all the time. The more you accustom yourself to that in you which is noticing everything. There's something in you which is conscious of everything all the time. It's conscious of dreams. It's conscious of what's arising right now. There's never a time it isn't. It can't be seen as an object. It's that pure, pure awareness that it's God. That which is seeing through your eyes right now is God. That which is seen is you and this room and these objects. Ever present, unborn, Right now, I amness is pure God. And the only problem is that you abandon that in order to identify with a finite object that's going to come, stay a while, torture you, and leave. 
That's the first noble truth of Buddhism. Second noble truth is, stop doing that, you schmuck. <laughs> <laughs> and the third and fourth noble truth is, there is a way to do that. Now, if you read, I mean, this is true of East and West, the really profound contemplative traditions, East and West. If you read the great Mahayana sutras that arose in the wake of this, they're really great, great, great Mahayana sutras. They all say one thing over and over and over again. They're talking about Bodhi, or the enlightened mind. And they say, if you could simply understand that it is unattainable, then you are enlightened. Hard is the meaning of that saying. It is to teach you to refrain from seeking. Over and over and over. The trick is, if you then try to stop seeking, because that's more of the same thing. It doesn't matter what's arising. There's an ever-present noticing of everything that's arising. And that literally is pure spirit and pure Godhead. So now that we all understand that, let's do some drugs. <laughs> and see if you're distracted. Uh, some people are distracted by sex. Some by, well, pizza, we've established that. Um, some by any object. And what happens temporarily is the happiness that comes from that radiant, pure self that you are. And its first form of manifestation, Sat Chidananda, pure being, pure presence, pure consciousness, and pure happiness, pure bliss. Well, as soon as we see an object that makes us happy, we are temporarily transferring that happiness that is ours to that object that we think causes. And that's the fundamental problem then, because you chase after the object as if that's the source of this being that is what you are, and this bliss that is what you are, and this presence that's what you are. And those objects will rip you up and head on out. So that ayahuasca, really, again, I've not done it, but I uniformly find some very, very positive, interesting experiences from that. Then people that have been very open about it. Uh, Samuel Bonder this was one of the really things that was instrumental in helping him awaken. Not because it causes the enlightened mind, but because by subtraction, it makes it harder to avoid the utterly obvious fact that you're aware. Strangely, we sort of go, oh, what, me? And yeah, you. So, so that's, you know, that we're going to start the uh, 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 illicit drug module. <laughs> and uh, we, yeah, we have 42 teacher volunteers for that. <laughs> um, just because they think that drugs are free, but they're not, we're charging them. <laughs> um, so, but that's, you know, there are, the, I think, uh, uh, um, a lot of the, clearly, a lot of the sacred ceremonies, some of them are, are merely shamanic, and that's not a put-down ones. They really specialize in subtle realms. And then you get an introduction to that, and that's very important. Uh, but subtly and over time, you start, you know, have somebody take it 20 or 30 times. And then it's like, oh, that again. Okay, Jaguar figure again. Okay. And then, you know, it's, it's like, okay. But what, what, what's the perceiver of all of that? What's the seer of all that? What's the feeler of all of that? And that hasn't changed. And that's what you are. So, but integral, sure, finds room for all of it. So, uh, yeah, I found, in a sense, it, like you're talking to Bob about, yeah, it dissociates you from your stage, yeah, because it obliterates your ego completely. Yeah. You have no choice but to actually merge with the divine. And, I think that's true. If you if you use meditation as well, and I think that's you true. You go into pure light, and therefore you come back down, and you. You realize that your whole life you were living before might have been a complete illusion or a load of crap or whatever. Yeah, I believe that's very true. Like I said, these states are authentic at whatever mm. stage. Those, they're, they're really authentic states. And then when you come out, though, then there is that understanding. It's fantastic. And you're still going to have to go through these stages. And like say, if you're blue and you have that, it will often move you into orange. It will help, it'll help do that. Yeah, it's you still got to do the hard work yourself. But, you, know, you can't rely on it. It's like watching a movie and thinking that by watching the movie that you've become that actor. You, know, you still have to go and do the training. Yeah, you know, yeah, 
Yeah. So I think it's really unfortunate that, I don't know, America, y'all must have noticed this, um, America is just one of, the, one of the most insane countries in the world. Uh, I, think, I think everybody, I think all nations should be like uh, Amsterdam. Um, uh, it's just the only rational uh, country I know. Now, it's sort of healthy green, but that, that's a leap ahead of, you know, where we, we have to go through that. Now, I think it's the very same way to do it. We have, as you know, this incredible blue underbelly in America. And you, Australia? Yeah. Well, you know the old saying, Australia got all of uh, Britain's criminals and America got all of her psychotics. <laughs> and I think y'all got the better deal. I, I really think that's just a much better way to do it. We just got the Irish people who stole a bit of bread. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Botany Bay was kind of kicking, you know, this was less fun like that. So we really have this, it's just insane. You must have noticed. I mean, the, the, most of the world looks at us, not just because we have, we're a nuclear power, with, a, with a, you know, a blue president. That just thrills Europe. <laughs> They're like, oh, jeez. So, I mean, I mean that's the, the, so crazy is that, that we actually got Germany and France to agree with each other, which is the first time ever. And, and, and Jacques Derrida and Jürgen Abermas did a book together. That, 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 that's how absolutely agreeing, the opening sentence was something like, you know, the one superpower now is run by a president who prays each day. And they're like, oh, no. And because the, the prayer here is not to a higher second person, but to a mythic second person who just happens, of course, to favor America. Uh, I, I know that if God you know, created all, all, all beings, that he or she would look down and go, yeah, I'll take that really fucked up country and call them my, <laughs> my chosen ones, you know. It's, but, I mean, the, the, that first statement of maybe the world's greatest living philosopher, you're going to Abermas, and certainly a guy who's, you know, kicking it up, Derrida, that, that that's the first thing that would concern them is very, very telling. And so we have that underbelly, and, the, you know, the two nations we have. And then we have this sort of trying to grow in this orange to green. And we are really a schizoid country for that reason. And it's, it's, a, it's a great experiment. It was the first country literally built, dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal and soon men, all men and women. And I think that's really quite extraordinary. And I would hate to see a vision of, of somebody like an Abraham Lincoln degenerate in, in, into what's happening now. Um, at the same time, people go through all these different levels. And they're allowed to stop where they are. It's just the great advance that was made by the founding fathers, and at the time it was the founding fathers, was that it would be an orange. That you didn't have to think orange, but in public you had to behave according to world-centric orange laws. Now that's that's genius. And unfortunately, now we kind of were notching down a bit, and that's a little bit scary. So stay tuned.